Blog Talk Radio. And in those days, there were giants in the land, and the sons of the angels of God looked upon the daughters of men and found them fair, and took of them wives, and their sons became of old great men of renown. So they have been mixing with us on a genetic level since the time of Enoch and Ezekiel's will. Here on earth we're intrigued by the sun, moon, and stars And imagine there's got to be planets like ours So conceive of a face on the surface of Mars So indeed of a meaning and purpose we lost That indeed they believe that these might be our gods Or that maybe with time we'll do right and evolve And eventually reach what they seek And then solve all the problems of man But they really don't know that they fall in the works of our hands All but just filthy rags So we travel the lands to dig up our past Time our lapses and and with it are much of the facts I'm imagine that God came in alien craft They react in this way They're so desperate for meaning and purpose But satanic service They know that they have evil motives Am I making you nervous? Ha! I'm just scratching the surface The signs from Ezekiel's will When the skies unfold like scrolls And the breaking of seals Heed the warning The message is clear Heed the warning the time draws near, see the signs from Ezekiel's wheel When the skies unfold like scrolls and the breaking of seals He's a warning, the message is clear, he's a warning The time draws near, in the blink of an eye All believers will be raptured, anyone left receives a mark Or the caption, this leader will arise Claim his origins are alien, possessed by Satan On the side of the Nephilim, profess those who left Held us back from evolving And now that they're gone We'll solve all of our problems The worship of any one God Will be all When I'm all into God Then I felt the exalted I'll play on these lines And in time I'll devise And arrive at a plan That will help hypnotize All the ones left behind The spiritually blind He sold in their souls Now we see in their minds It's already started We're seeing the signs Just study the word prophecies All the lines That chop off the heads Of all those who fight at one earth, one world, aren't you excited? The signs from Ezekiel's wheel, when the skies unfold like scrolls and the breaking of seals, he's a warning, the message is clear, he's a warning, the time draws near, see the signs from Ezekiel's wheel, when the skies unfold like scrolls and the breaking of seals, he's a warning, the message is clear, he's a warning, the time draws near. Where will you be in the year 2012? Are they casting a spell? They're not ready to tell. It's time to reveal what they tried to keep veiled. Pure evil they hail and they sell it so well. He fell from the heavenly realms where he dwelt. The once beautiful angel they tried to rebel. Expelled from the light into darkness and hell. Now a serpent and snake with reptilian scale. He wears the disguise with angelic wings and mimics the truth with a lie so obscene. He always repeats the same thing. He told Eve that you'll be supreme A king or a queen That you can evolve to an enlightened being A god of your own that can do anything He feeds on our souls with this fraudulent scheme In so many ways but it's all just the same Take the signs from Ezekiel's wheel When the skies unfold like scrolls And the breaking of seals He's the warning The message is clear He's the warning the time draws near, see the signs from Ezekiel's wheel When the skies unfold like scrolls and the breaking of seals He's a warning, the message is clear, he's a warning The time draws near Why hide yourself with, you know, creating UFO crafts and things like that? Why that deception if that's indeed what's going on? The creatures figured out that there was one way that they could frighten mankind, and that is to present themselves as technologically superior beings from physical UFOs. Why would they want to abduct human beings? UFO abduction might not be caused by physical occupants, but from creatures living in perhaps what we would call another dimension. Mm-hmm. Posing as occupants. Yes, the same type of interfering, harassing, uh, paraphysical creature in every culture worldwide. Welcome, friends, readers, listeners, viewers from wherever you may be tuning in, whichever part of the world. I hope that life finds you well and in good health and happy and finding joy in your every day. And I... Uh, also hope and pray that um, 
your family members, your children, your loved ones, those that you care the most about, that they are also finding urgency in the moment and waking themselves up to the reality of what's going on around us and uh, what we as a world, as a collective, are facing together with the onslaught of the New World Order and the push for global government, the the necessity of the transnational elitists, uh, their belief that they need to push a third global war. And that in doing so, they can propel their agenda to the necessary height to then culminate the whole end game of what they've been aspiring to all these decades and years and centuries, even millennia, that the New World Order is nothing new. It's the same thing that Nimrod had set up so long ago in the first attempt to unite the world uh, in his uh, push to create the Tower of Babel. Same thing. We know what the Lord thought about the New World Order then. Came down, confounded the tongues, separated the peoples into groups and tribes so that they could not understand each other in language and dialogue. Confusion reigned. And so that one world organization was disrupted and broken up and uh, scattered abroad. And so the, the New World Order this time, they may succeed for uh, a short while for the time that those ten kings give their power unto the beast. And this system may reign for a short while, but we know that it too will be destroyed by the cornerstone, the, the he who was rejected. And so that whole vision and, and the prophecy of Daniel in and, and the statue um is the same thing. We are culminating to the end point of the beast system where it says they, they would mix themselves in with the seed of man. So that's an interesting uh, passage to look at as well. This will be the third part ongoing series of the trees in paradise uh, and the discussion between the the enmity between the seed lines and the war between the seed lines and how it's culminating to where we find ourselves now with the with the trigger point being Israel and Iran and that even though Iran hasn't attacked any of its neighbors in a very long time and and though it is being given support and aid to build this nuclear bomb so that it can be a threat for this you know the push for this next war Iran's military is not uh that formidable in sense that as as far as size wise but as far as guerrilla tactics and terror wise it's like a rabid dog you know these terror groups are like rabid dogs they're like animals that are dangerous even unto themselves and um and it's it's sad that this opposition is going to be enhanced and escalated to the point 
of bloodshed and pandemonium, which um, impacted with the global financial debt and the, uh, the austerity measures that are being implemented and especially right now in a lot of the countries that are begging for bailouts like Greece and Spain and soon coming Portugal, uh, Ireland begging for a restructure of their debt. And so in Spain, I don't know if you've seen the news at all, but the people there are rioting to such a degree that the police are just battering battering people with batons and cracking skulls and uh, in France you just had um, a super tax implemented 75% rate and all the wealthy and those that do have money are exiting country and looking for safe haven elsewhere Uh, so You know, that's not going to help the situation either. Things are getting out of hand because people are starving. People are having a hard time just managing and making it and surviving and being able to feed themselves and their kids. And, And for people that have multiple kids, it's very difficult. It's very difficult in this day and age because everything is so expensive. And when it comes to child and child care, it's a necessity. There's no other way about it. And so people, you, you have to take care of your children, you know, you have to take care of of yourself as well and and so many um, there's now so many people that are even families you know whole families that are homeless and and have no option no choice and are have no idea as to where to go the food banks are dissipated and not being restocked to the degree that they had once been when, you know, abundance was across the board available to all people everywhere and there was more of a spirit of giving because there was more to give. The Illuminati, they create depressions, and I'll tell you how they do it. Uh, They they create a crisis, they'll inflate the crisis, and then they'll create a crash and burn situation where the masses are affected and people are impacted, and it's the majority that suffer. And they've done this time and time again. They've engineered this to a perfection. And that's why I know the next one's going to be just terrible the 2008 crash was not was not the culmination of their plan that was just a trial run flash crash way for them to profit move money out of the United States because that's what's been happening over the course of who knows how long now but they've been moving money out of the states true wealth assets out of the states They're going to bankrupt this nation as they're bankrupting the other countries of the world. And then they go in afterwards and buy up everything, buy up everything like it's on a fire sale. And I know this isn't the the topic of the show, and I'll go into that as well. Uh, But uh, this needs to be said, and you need to know about these things as well. Because what happens is the money supply is withdrawn. They take the liquidity out of the market to such a degree that people are forced to default 
on their debt just simply because there's not enough money in the system and available for people to be able to pay their normal monthly bills. There's more debt than there is money and liquidity. And so people are being forced to sell and liquidate their assets. And soon this is going to happen on a statewide, a local, and a federal nationwide level. So that assets such as infrastructure, highways, post offices, whatever, whatever it is that the government still has access to, whether it's mining land, uh, oil property, whatever it is that the industrialists, the transnationalists, uh, China, those that have the money, they're going to come in and buy up everything. And they're going to buy it for cheap. And that's why all this is being done. Um, I'm going to go into the show now. Let me check the chat room. Just give a shout out to everybody. To G4, for fun, all the guests. Math, Mama B, thank y'all for joining us and for always supporting the show. Y'all are uh, close, close friends and I give thanks for each and every one. And we've got a, a lot of new listeners too. And so uh, that's why I've been reiterating some of this information and retouching base on some of this information. But I will go into Samael. And I'm going to set this up to lay out, because I did mention some about Samael and I read some from the Targums. And I'm going to actually bring that information up again. But before I do, I'm going to link it to this. Um, in the in the past shows that I've done on the lineage of Christ and the holiness of of not only His incarnation and His coming into the flesh as the Savior Messiah, but also his mother and the parents, Joachim and Anna, uh, the parents of Mary, how they were very holy and very pious people and how they were servants unto the Lord to such a degree that they did find favor in his sight, in the sight of the Father. And so the father utilized Mary and her vow, her perpetual vow to remain chaste and and virgin uh, unto the Holy Spirit. Uh, That was the whole reason why she was chosen as receptacle. And for a lot of people uh, that read only the Old and the New Testament, there's passage which says that um, Christ had brothers and sisters. And that is true. But what what is not said and what is not unfolded within the context of those particular texts and that you have to go outside of the story to the pseudepigraphal text to get a little bit more detail on this is that they were not blood brothers and sisters. They are half-brothers only through Joseph in that they were uh, of a of a prior family of Joseph. Um, and there's a chapter in Matthew that that also reiterates the story. And, and so we'll start with this because this will lead into how I want to set up going into Samael and setting up the Targum text. This passage is Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. It says this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. See, before she came together with Joseph, she was already pregnant. 
And remember, according to the pseudepigraphal text, Mary was a 14-year-old virgin that was being pushed out of the temple because all the girls that reached the age of 14 would go and marry according to the old tradition and the the way it was set up, you know, uh, back then. They married young, I, I guess. Uh, but Mary did not want to get married. And so the the priest prayed about it and was told uh, by the father to have all of the patriarchs of the various tribes to bring their staffs, because back then everybody carried a staff. And so they brought their staffs up to the front, and the Lord said he would provide signs. And the Father did so in that a rose bloomed from the end of Joseph's staff, and a dove landed on the end of the, the flower. And so that was signed to the priests and to the rest of the congregation that Joseph, who was already widowed and already an elderly man who did not want to marry Mary and was reluctant to do so, he was chosen and, you know, that he was ordained to be the protector to be the fatherly figure, so to speak, for Mary and the child Christ. And so to to verify this, I'm going to read one other passage, and this is from the Protoevangelion of James, which is the text that deal with the early childhood life of Christ. And if you have not read those texts, they fill in the gaps from, you know, how there's no stories of of Christ's early infancy or childhood in the canon of the, the Bible. And why that is, I don't know. There's a, you know, one story of him being left by Joseph and Mary and them having to go back to the temple and finding him there. Uh, but that's, and then, you know, him coming to his ministry. But what, you know, we know something else happened. Where are those stories? Well, those stories are in the forbidden books of the Bible, in the forgotten books of Eden. And they're part of the Proto-Evangelion of James. And you can find those texts there, or you can just go to sacredtext.com and you can find those texts there as well. Matter of fact, after I read this passage, I'll paste the link there so that you can... uh, For those that have access to the chat room, you can go check this out for yourself. It says this. Now it was the sixth month with her, and behold, Joseph came from his building. And he entered into his house and found her great with child. And he smote his face and cast down upon the ground sackcloth and wept bitterly, saying, With what countenance shall I look unto the Lord my God? And what prayer shall I make concerning this maiden? For I received her out of the temple of the Lord my God, a virgin, and have not kept her safe. Who is he that hath ensnared me? Who hath done this evil in mine house, and hath defiled the virgin? Is not the story of Adam repeated in me? For as at the hour of his giving thanks, the serpent came and found Eve alone and deceived her, so hath it befallen me also. And Joseph arose from off the sackcloth and called Mary and said unto her, O thou wast cared for by God, Why hast thou done this? So you see in this story. Now I'll set the premise uh, for the foundation of this story as well. Joseph, after he received Mary as his bride from the temple, 
He took her home. She was 14 years old. He took her home, left her at his house. He was a builder. He did construction. He went out to build. He went out for six months, and he was working. And when he came home, he found her six months pregnant, great with child. And notice that here he says, Um, who hath done this evil in my house and hath defiled the virgin? Is not the story of Adam repeated in me? What story is that? The story of Adam and how it's repeated in him? For as at the hour of his giving thanks, the serpent came and found Eve alone and deceived her. The serpent came and found Eve alone and deceived her. So hath it befallen me also. Right here. I mean, this reference is speaking of what happened in the garden. And what was that? That was Samael, the angel of death, serpent, uh, Satan, that deceived Eve, impregnated her with the firstborn son, Cain. And so you have it here in the story as well, being repeated. Now, I'm going to go to this is an interesting piece of information as well and then we'll go into Samuel this will set the premise hello exit Babylon thanks for joining us appreciate you uh, coming to the show and checking us out um, all right, let me go back to this information here. All right, this is interesting information to, as well. We know that Cain was left out of the genealogy of Adam. Genesis chapter 5 mentions the genealogy of Adam. Genesis 4 has the genealogy of Cain. But another thing that is of interest, there's actually two other things that are of interest here is that Cain is also left out of the genealogy of Jesus Christ mentioned in Luke chapter 3, verse 23 to 38. That's the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Luke chapter 3, verse 23 through 38, which is... I'm going to read here, actually. And there was a time, um, I think it was when I was going through, I did a show on the genealogy of, of Mary and Christ. And in that show, I read from the Keber Nagas, the whole line, same thing, the genealogy of Christ is mentioned in the Keber Nagas, going from... Seth to Christ, same thing. Cain is not mentioned in the genealogy. He's not mentioned in the line of Christ, in the Savior's line, in Adam's line. And so for those that are still struggling with this information, do you still doubting and you still want to just hold on to Genesis chapter 4 1 even though I've read you know the other accountings and we'll go into that as well um, and I know this is difficult information but remember this has no bearing on salvation this has no nothing to do with your relationship with the son or the father and whether you believe this this way or not, 
will not keep you separate from salvation if you are so righteously deserving. I do think, however, that this information, once you embrace it and look into it as a truth, is a skeleton key for unlocking so much that is yet veiled and still considered secretive within the word and will piece together so much of what has still been hidden from the masses. Now, the Masons, the elitists, they know this. They know about Cain. They know about the hybrid line. And they they brag about this information. They make fun of you for not knowing about it. All right, verse, starting with verse 21. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying the heaven was open. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son. In thee I am very well pleased. Or I am well pleased. Not very, sorry. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli, which was the son of Mathat, which was the son of Levi, which was the son of Melchi, which was the son of Jana, which was the son of Joseph, which was the son of Matthias, which was the son of Amos, which was the son of Nahum, which was the son of Esli, which was the son of Nagi, which was the son of Math, which was the son of which was the son of Joanna, which was the son of Risa, which was the son of Zerarabel, which was the son of Salathiel, which was the son of Neri which was the son of Jose, which was the son of Eleazar, which was the son of Joram, which was the son of Mathat, who was the son of Levi, which was the son of Simeon, which was the son of Judah, which was the son of Joseph, which was the son of Jonah, which was the son of Eliakim, which was the son of Melia, and which was the son of Manan, which was the son of Matata which was the son of Nathan. And I know I'm probably butchering a lot of these names. Please forgive me. <laughs> which was the son of David. Which was the son of Jesse. Which was the son of Obed. Which was the son of Boaz. Boaz. Which was the son of Salmon. Which was the son of Nathan. Which was the son of Amenadab. Amenadab which was the son of Aram, which was the son of Esram, which was the son of Thares, which was the son of Judah, which was the son of Jacob, which was the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Thara, and the son of Nacor, the son of Serach, the son of Ragua, the son of Phelek, the son of Eber, and the son of Selah, the son of Canaan, the son of Ephraxed, the son of Sem, and who was the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Yared, which was the son of Malalil, the son of Canaan, which was the son of Enos, who was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam. And says Adam was the son of God. And so you see there in this lineage, and this is the same thing for the Kevin of God, in the genealogy of Christ, no mention of Cain. And so if Cain is the firstborn son of Adam, would not he be given the firstborn's right? you know, of of succession and uh, ascension, and wouldn't he be honored here? And so you have to ask yourself, why? 
Why is he left out? All right, so this is going to lead into Samael. Now, going into Samael, I'm going to read a little bit from the Wikipedia just to set up who he was. And then we're going to make the association to Samael with being the feathered serpent, the Nakash of Genesis chapter 3, which was the show that I did Wednesday night where I set the premise for what we're going into today. Samael is an important, this is Wikipedia, is an important archangel in Talmudic and post-Talmudic lore, a figure who is accuser, seducer, and destroyer, and has been regarded as both good and evil. Now, I'm, I'm going to disagree with some of what's going to be said here, but because uh, it does make mention of him um, as being a good angel destroyer, which I know all the angels are in, even the fallen ones, they're in service to the Lord and cannot do anything unless he uh, says so. But I, I definitely think Samuel is part of the fallen ones. Um, all right. And has been regarded as both good and evil. It is said that he was the guardian angel of Esau and a patron of the Roman Empire. He is considered in legend a member of the heavenly host with often grim and destructive duties. In the New Testament, named Satan and the chief of the evil spirits, one of Samael's greatest roles in Jewish lore is that of the angel of death. He remains one of the Lord's servants, even though he appears to want men to do evil. As a good angel, Samael resides in the seventh heaven, although he is declared to be the chief angel of the fifth heaven. I'm going to make a comment here. Um, Samael and any angel that does evil, they are from the six heavens and below. And there's only thrones for them up to the fifth heaven. They only have access to the lower five heavens with the sixth heaven being Sophia, who is considered matter, wisdom, and she is the veil between what is the imperishable and the perishable, the invisible and the visible, the seen and the unseen, that which is light and that which is darkness, or that which is the etheric and that which is material. It's the, she's the meaning place between spirit and matter, between um, heaven and the earth, so to speak. And so, and if you read the, the books of Enoch or the, any of the books that I made mention of that talked about the passages of the various patriarchs through the ten heavens, um, I spoke about the ascension of Isaiah, Isaiah's passage through the ten heavens, the secret of Enoch, the book of the secrets of Enoch or Enoch 2, Enoch's passage through the ten heavens, the apocalypse of Peter, uh, Peter's passage through the ten heavens, the vision of Paul, Paul's ascension and passage through the ten heavens, uh, one other one. I think I'm forgetting one. The Apocalypse of Peter. Did I make mention of that one? The Apocalypse of Peter. Peter is taken up through the ten heavens as well. That's a fragmented text. Of the, uh, it's not available in its fullness. But it does give you insight in fragments as to what I talked about as far as paradise. And the Arcturusian Lake and the separation between 
the place of righteousness and the place of destruction, of torment. All right, continuing. In Jewish lore, Samael is said to be the angel of death, the chief ruler of the fifth heaven, and one of the seven regents of the world served by two million angels. He resides in the heaven Yalkut, 110 of the Talmud, speaks of Samael as Esau's guardian angel. Samael's guardian angel, and in the sayings of Rabbi Eleazar, he is charged with being the one who tempted Eve and then seduced and impregnated her with Cain. This is the Wikipedia. So this story is known by the elites and those that you know serve uh, Satan that are selected to be privy to certain wisdom and certain lore. Uh, even Albert Pike, he writes about this in, in the uh, Morals and Dogma. It's in there as well. Um, so I'm going to read that passage again. And in the sayings of Rabbi Eleazar, he is charged with being the one who tempted Eve and then seduced and impregnated her with Cain. And though some sources identify Gadzriel as the angel that seduced Eve, other Hebrew scholars say that it was Samael who tempted Eve in the guise of the serpent. Samael is also sometimes identified as being the angelic antagonist who wrestled with Jacob. And that's another interesting story because I had somebody ask me about Jacob recently and I couldn't remember where that question was, but um, I wanted to make mention of this, that, it, you know, it it says that Samael was the one that had made, had wrestled with Jacob, which kind of makes sense, you know. Um, but anyway, and also the angel who held back the arm of Abraham, Abraham as he was about to sacrifice his I don't know that I don't actually think that Samael was the one that uh, held back Abraham's arm. Now, whether he wrestled with Jacob, I don't know, but I think that was one of the angels of the Lord, the good angels of the Lord that don't do evil, that support the goodness, the compassion, the rule of law, the justice. The love, you know. All right. Just a little bit more from this, and then I'm going to actually get into the text. Because it's interesting, especially for those who have never read it. Um, The Holy Kabbalah, Samael, is described as the severity of God and is listed as the fifth of the archangel of the world of Bria. Samael is said to have taken Lilith as his bride after she left Adam. Um, in There's a book called The Testament of Solomon. For those that are interested in the stories of, of the demons and the fallen angels and um, what they did while they were here, this is a pretty interesting book because Solomon is given the power and the capacity to control these demons and does so for the glory and for the benefit of of the Father and the Son because he has the angels to build the temple of, of God. And that's why it was so prestigious and so magnificent in, in its original construction is because uh, they, you know, there was supernatural assistance being utilized there. Uh, so anyways, in that Testament of Solomon, there's an angel named Asmodeus. And Asmodeus talks about how he's the, 
he's born from an angel in heaven and also of a earthly mother. And that because of that, he's partially divine and and that he says that he is the one that took Lilith uh, as a bride. It says that in that text, it says that Lilith uh, took Asmodeus as a bride. But anyway, continuing on here. Samael is said to have taken Lilith as his bride after she left Adam. According to Zoroastric Kabbalah, Samuel was also mated with Isis, Zenu, Nama, and Agret Bat Matlak, whoever those are, all angels of sacred prostitution. Interesting that they should mention Nama here. Um, for those that don't know, there's one text that may mention, uh, and I think this is the Book of Jubilees, uh, speaks of Nama as being the wife of Noah. Nama was the twin sister of Tubal Cain, uh, who was the son of Lamech, or the grandson of Lamech. And he was the one that went hunting with his grandfather, Lamech, when, when Lamech was old and blind. And in his hunting with Tubal Cain, he killed Cain and then afterwards killed his grandson and then went to his two wives, which interesting enough, interesting, interestingly enough, uh, Lamech was also the first polygamist and the first, and he was of Cain's line, but he was the first one to take multiple wives. And he told his two wives then that uh, if, you know, Cain was to be cursed, then he was going to be, you know, 77 times cursed because of his killing Cain and also killing Tubal Cain. And so you can find that story in in one of these Babylonian um, Jewish texts as well. And the Talmud of the Har, one of them, I can't remember. Um, just a little bit more. In Gnosticism, this is the last part I want to cover here, because the Gnostic texts, the Nag Hammadi Codices, talk a lot about Samael as well. Matter of fact, Samael is one of the major names of the fallen god Yadavath. Yadavath, his other name is Sakla, says this. In the Apocryphon of John, found in the Nag Hammadi Library, Samael is the third name of the Demiurge, whose other names are Yaldabaoth and Sakla. In this context, Samael means the blind god. The theme of blindness runs throughout the Gnostic works. His appearance is that of a lion-faced serpent-like being, which if I find the, a passage a little bit later, I'll read you that description that's part of my next book. I cover all the Nag Hammadi codices in great detail in my next book because I know so many of you have never studied them, never had chance to study them, and find them confusing anyway. And so I hope to bring some clarity to light on those particular texts with the publication of this book. And um, also, just so you know, I've already started my next one, and I've also been asked to make these books into audio books, and I and I will do that at at a point where I get some space and time. I will do that. I will make these texts available because I know so many don't have time to read, and so many of you also like to listen while you're on the road. You know. Um, going between job and work or whatever. A lot of people have a lot of time on the road and that, you know, what better way to utilize it and to make it beneficial than to listen to podcasts that are good for your uh, spiritual soul, life, well-being, you know. So 
Um, okay, last sentence here. His appearance is that of a lion-faced serpent being in all the origin of the world in the Nakamati Library text. He is also referred to as Ariel. So, now we're going to go to the story. All right. Everybody's got sound, right? Jazz, give me a shout out as far as because uh, G4 says you don't have sound. Just want to make sure everybody's good. So I'll come back and check that because I know you guys are a few minutes behind me as well. All right. Going into the text on the Targums to set this story. Finish it up. It says this. Excuse me while I get a sip of water real quick. All right, this is, um, and I'm just going to cover a few quick passages from chapter 3, 4, and 5. And these are from the various Targums, which just, to explain a little bit about them, the Targums are the various language translations that the original Hebrew Torah was translated into um, because the people, once the temple was burned down and they were taken and exiled to Babylon, they forgot their original language. And after 70 years of assimilation, uh, Hebrew was only remembered well and spoken and known by these scholars, those that were uh, great students of the bib biblical text and their original reference. But for the lay people and for the masses, they had to be translated. And so this was done in various what are called targums, which simply means translations, came into being. And two of the languages that were translated were Aramaic and Palestinian. And so these uh, passages that I'm going to read are English translations of those particular Targum translations. And they give you a little more insight into what was referenced, being spoken of, and talked about in the King James Version of the Bible and the um, other succeeding Bibles that came of a later date. And these go back to 1st century CE, 2nd century CE, at the very beginning formation and founding of the church. All right, it says this, very first passage is chapter 3. And the woman beheld Samael, except for in the Targum, Samael is spelled with two M's. But Otherwise, Samael spelled S-A-M-A-E-L. And the woman beheld Samael, the angel of death, calling him by name and also by his capacity, and was afraid, yet she knew that the tree was good to eat and that it was medicine for the enlightenment of the eyes and desirable tree by means of which to understand. Stand. And she took of its fruit and did eat. She gave to her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of both were enlightened, and they knew that they were naked, divested of the purple robe in which they had been created. And they saw the sight of their shame and sowed to themselves the leaves of figs, and made to them themselves cinchers. The Lord God brought the three unto judgment, and he said to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, cursed art thou of all the cattle, and of all the beasts of the field, upon thy belly thou shalt go, and thy feet shall be cut off, and thy skin Thou shalt cast away once in seven years, 
and the poison of death will be in thy mouth, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Here's the important part. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between the seed of thy son and the seed of her son. And it shall be when the sons of the woman keep the commandments of the law, they will be propelled to smite thee upon thy head. But when they forsake the commandments of the law, thou wilt be ready to wound them in their heel. So going back, it makes mention that Samael, this is chapter 3 of the Targum, Samael, the angel of death, was the serpent, the Nakash of Genesis 3, the serpent in the garden, the feathered serpent, according to the um, the old Thracian text, the 4,000-year-old Thracian text that my friend sent to me, the book of Atom and Ua, E-U-A, which is an old Thracian text which precedes the Sumerians by a couple thousand years. Um, anyways, it also says here that the father is going to put enmity between thee and the woman and between the seed of thy son. Who is the seed of thy son and the seed of her son? We know who her sons are, but who is this the seed of thy son? Notice not sons, but just thy son. Because he only had one with Eve, with the uh, with the uh, mother of humanity. And that was Cain. So, enmity between the seed of thy son and the seed of her son's plural. Okay? All right, going into Genesis chapter 4, 1. From the various Targums. And there's three, four different translations, and I'm going to read from each one of them. Genesis 4.1 And Adam knew his wife Eve, who had desired the angel, and she conceived and bare Cain. She said, I have acquired a man, the angel of the Lord. All right, so we know even, let me pull up the King James Version real quick. Go to Genesis. All right, Genesis 4 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, semicolon, and she conceived, comma, and bare Cain, comma, and said, comma, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Okay. Adam knew Eve, his wife. We got that. She conceived their Cain. And then third part, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Okay? Looking at the Targum passages again from the Palestinian Targum. Adam knew his wife Eve. Yes, we know that. Same as with the King James Version. Who had desired the angel. Wait a second. Who had desired the angel... What angel? Well, according to the text, that's Samael, the angel of death, right? So, um, and Adam, King James Version 4.1 again, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, she conceived, bare Cain, said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Now, why is it that they took out the who had desired the angel? And Adam knew, again, from the Palestinian Targum, and Adam knew his wife Eve, 
who had desired the angel, semicolon, and she conceived, comma, and bare Cain. And she said, I have acquired a man, the angel of the Lord. All right, let's go to a different Targum and look at this. The Targum of Onkelos, which is the most widely accepted and um, verifiable, is the Aramaic Targum, says this. And Adam knew Hava, which is Eve, Hava, his wife, who had desired the angel. Again, here you have who had desired the angel. What angel? Samael, the angel of death. And Adam knew Hava, his wife, who had desired the angel, and she conceived and bare Cain. And she said, I have acquired a man, the angel of the Lord. Notice next sentence. This is important. And she added to bear from her husband, Adam, his twin, even Abel. Okay, so with this passage, you have a little bit more detail. First, you have the the same passage that all of them include about Adam, yes, knowing his wife, Hava, but who had desired the angel that is stricken out, totally expunged, eradicated, dissipated, disappeared. Who had desired the angel. And she conceived and bare Cain. She said, I have acquired a man, the angel of the Lord. But here it says, and then and she added to bear from her husband Adam. This is after the birth of Cain. Added to bear from her husband Adam, his twin, even Abel. So there it gives you a complete separation and speaks uh, specifically on um, on Cain being, you know, from her desire for the angel, and Adam uh, being responsible for the birth of Abel. Now let's look at the Targum of Jonathan. And Adam knew his wife Eve, now this is a little bit different, who was pregnant by the angel Samael. So in this passage, it gives direct uh, responsibility for her pregnancy to the angel Samael. And she conceived and bare Cain. Next part. And he was like the heavenly beings and not like the earthly beings. And she said, I have acquired a man, the angel of the Lord. So even more detail here. Looking into the passage again. Genesis 4.1. From the Targum of Jonathan. Adam knew his wife Eve. Yes, we get that from the King James Version of part who was pregnant by the angel of Samuel. That we do not get. That's a very interesting passage. Who was pregnant by the angel of Samuel, which makes sense because, you know, Samuel was mentioned earlier in Genesis chapter 3, and if Samuel is in the Kosh and the serpent, it, 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 he would be responsible for her seduction. And she conceived and bare Cain. Okay, well, that that makes sense. Yes, she was seduced by the angel Samuel. She conceived and bare Cain. Yes, Cain being the firstborn son of the angel Samuel. And he was like the heavenly beings, meaning that he was like the angelic beings not like those born of woman, not like the earthly being. And she said, I have acquired a man, the angel of the Lord. Interesting, huh? 
All right, one final thing from the Targum, and then I'm going to make a mention of something else from the, the codices, which is interesting as well. But this is from Chapter 5. And I know I covered this in the show that I did on the Nakash of Genesis 3. But this is important information, in my opinion. And I think you should hear it. And you should know about it. And you should study these targums for yourself. They're interesting. Interesting reading. And again, I'm not saying that they're divinely inspired or that you know, that they come straight from the hand of God. Because these are translations that were written by scribes, but they were read side by side in the synagogue. And they were accepted uh, by the church authorities, the, the rabbis. Chapter 5. This is the book of the genealogy of man. In the day that the Lord created man, in the likeness of the Lord he made him. Male and female he created them and blessed them in the name of his word. And he called their name man in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begat Sheth who had the likeness of his image and of his similitude. For before had Hava, that's Eve, born Cain, who was not like to him. And Habel, who was killed by his hand, and Cain was cast out. Neither is his seed genealized in the book of the genealogy of Adam. But afterwards there was one born like him, and he called his name Sheth. So in this passage, which you don't find this in the King James Version of the Bible either, this whole, this is the book of the genealogy of man, which you find in every one of the Targums is not in the King James Version of the Bible, completely stripped out. Um, it says this, again, focus on the differences between the similitudes and the likenesses between Cain, Abel, and Sheth, because Cain is not like Adam. In in four one it says he's like the heavenly beings and not like earthly beings. So here again. And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years and begat Sheth who was who had the likeness of his image and of his similitude. For before had Hava so when Sheth was born, and this is after the murder of Abel, Sheth was also like Adam and looked like Adam and had the same characteristics and likeness and innocence that Adam and Eve had. But notice here it says, For before had Hava born Cain. So before, you know, before Cain was the firstborn who was not like to him. So Cain, the firstborn, was not like Adam. And Abel, it says here, Abel was killed by his hand. If he was not like Adam, and he killed his brother, he certainly did not have the innocence of Adam and Eve. He had schizophrenic and evil tendencies that drove him to murder his father. There's even stories in the Talmud. Now, I can't tell you if it's the Talmud or the Zohar. It's one of those. The Midrash, Midrashic text. Can't remember, but there's a reference to an illusion, so to speak, of Cain 
uh, re- reveling in Abel's blood. And there's also speculation that Cain even drank of his brother's blood. Now, whether that's true or not, can't say. But there is speculation you can find reference to that when you do some deeper research on the story. So, after Cain was cast out, now it says, neither is his seed genealized in the book of the genealogy of Adam. Neither is his seed. So neither is Cain nor his seed line genealized in the book of the genealogy of Adam. There you have it. There you have it. Now I'm going to read you one other story that is real interesting that Links to, ties to, connects to. Let's see if I can find it here for you. Uh. Oh, yeah. I think I found it. All right, before I do read this and go into this, let me go ahead and check the chat room again. Jazz, I will pray for you, sister. Shabbat shalom, everybody. And I I pray for all of you because I know so many are having a hard time as far as just dealing with life and being and just, you know, the pressures of the world are such that Satan is attacking us all. And I know that many are in financial constraints and financial difficulties because of the state of the world and because of the financial collapse that's being perpetrated and being pushed upon the world in order to forge this new world order system, this new financial regulatory, this new one world religion, political, governmental system, basically communism is what you, what the new world order agenda and system is. It's a total atheistic system where uh, the elitists and the, the those that run the system of anarchy and totalitarianism, that they rule with impunity and they control the wealth and delve it out as they wish to the rest of the uh, the rest of everybody trying to fight for scraps from the table, so to speak. This is the whole rich man Lazarus scenario. The 11th says uh, Samuel is about as much of a threat to us as Sarah. None of these, you know, they would have no power unless the Lord, the Father, our King, uh, His Son, gave them authority to do the things that they do. They, They can't do anything. And and you're right, they have no authority over us. But so many, look at how many people invite them into their lives. How many people offer their souls and their their purpose, their intent, their focus to these beings. And when they do, when you go to a Ouija board and you invite them into your lives and you become possessed, what do you expect? When you go to a a graveyard at midnight to try to catch some EVPs and you have some kind of schizophrenic supernatural experience, what did you expect? I welcome Peace 333 and the 11th um, and all the other new listeners that are coming in and out. For those that have not been to the show. We appreciate your willingness to to try something new and to listen to something different. All right, I'm going to finish up 
the premise of all that that I had laid out. And this is going to tie into something from the Nakamani Codices, which is completely separate from the pseudepigraphal and the apocryphal texts, which I've been reading from. And this is further confirmation on exactly what I've been telling you. It says this, He who has been created is beautiful, but you would not find his son's noble creation. If he were not created, but begotten, you would find that his seed was noble. But now he was created, and he begot. What nobility is this? First, adultery came into being. Afterward, murder. And he was begotten in adultery, for he was the child of the serpent. And so he became a murderer, just like his father. And he killed his brother. I want to dissect this. Because if you can understand this passage, then you will understand the truth of all the things that I've been telling you, especially in this show. If you can decipher this one passage, it will clarify the whole issue of Cain for you. Let's look at it. First sentence. He who has been created is beautiful, but you would not find his son's noble creation. All right, first off, notice the difference between created and begotten. That's the key, all right? Now, he who has been created is beautiful. We know that there was a certain angel that was created by the Father that was the first archangel that had glory, but iniquity was found within him, vanity, and he fell. And that, uh, continuing where it says, but you would not find his son's noble creations. Why would you not find his son's noble creations? Next sentence. If he were not created, meaning if he were not created but begotten, you would find that his seed was noble. Second sentence means that if he was not an angel, if this individual that was the father of Cain was not a created angel but begotten of woman, and born naturally, when he gave birth to children, his seed, being natural, would have been noble and would have been of of the natural processes, so to speak, not not of a hybrid, abominable unnatural, uh, unblessed creation. And so that's, that's the key for line two. If he were not created but begotten, you would find that his seed was noble, continuing. But now he was created, meaning Satan, He was created. He was an angel that was created. And he begot, meaning he seduced Eve, impregnated her, and had children by her. That was not a natural creation. And that's why he was not a noble creation as being referenced 
in this passage. Okay, line four. What nobility is this? Okay, he was an angel and he was responsible for seducing Eve, impregnating her. They're saying, where is nobility in this? What's noble about this? There is nothing noble about that. It says this, that act, that act, next line. First, adultery came into being. Afterward, murder. So his seduction of Eve and impregnating her with Cain and be, having begotten children from her was the first case of adultery. Adultery, it says first adultery came into being and then afterward murder. So his seduction of Eve, considered the first adultery, led to the birth of the first unknowable begotten seed, a hybrid seed line on the planet, which was Cain, and that this adultery led to murder, which is exactly what happened. Once Cain was born, he killed his brother, who was the first person to succumb to death, the first person to be murdered as part of the second world age, and spirit incarnating into flesh upon a fallen world where the devils and the demons hold reign for a short time. So, first adultery came into being, afterward murder. And he was begotten in adultery, for he was the child of the serpent. There you go, plain as day, laid out. But still people will deny And he was begotten in adultery, for he was the child of the serpent. So he became a murderer, just like his father. What's that? He became a murderer, just like his father. Who did, who did Satan murder? He murdered the angels by causing us to fall into the flesh. He murdered himself by causing himself to be into the flesh. He was the one that brought death into being. He's the angel of death, Samael. And so you see, he became a murderer just like his father, and he killed his brother. Now, I know I don't have time, but I would invite everybody to look at the at Matthew chapter 13. Let me see if I can find it here real quick. Go to Matthew chapter 13 and look at the parable of the sower that invaded the garden and sowed the tares. It's the same thing that I've been speaking about, talking about this whole show with Joseph coming home and finding Mary already pregnant and saying that is not what happened to Adam also what happened to me. It's this, the whole thing is the same story. It's spoken about everywhere. Spoken about everywhere. And yet, people miss the connections. They miss the connections. They can't put it together because they don't have discernment on it. And so if you don't have discernment on it, you're going to miss it. And if you miss it, not saying it has any bearing on salvation, but you're going to miss a lot of the secrets that are contained within the Word. All right. 
here's the parables, and I'm gonna, and I'm going to leave it with this. We're going to leave it with this. This is Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man, which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. And so the servant of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Well, wilt thou then we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together into the harvest and in the time of the harvest. I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, I want to finish this with the um, passage from verse 36 on. This is when the, the disciples came to him and asked him about the parable of the tares of the field. He said, He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. And therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father who hath ears to hear let him here. And for me, friends, that is self explanatory. There's no need to even follow up with explanation. The Lord laid it out to you thousands of years ago, told you about this day and age, warned you about the days of Noah, spoke about they who would mix themselves with the seed of men. This is where we are, people. This is what we're dealing with. This is the reality of the situation we find ourselves in. And even though it sounds crazy, sounds lunatic fringe, and sounds just beyond possibility, you have to embrace truth as it is, no matter what it is, because, you know, we can't just make those things up for ourselves. We have to embrace truth as we find it in whatever ugly form it packages itself in. And sometimes, yes, it packages itself into some very ugly form. I pray the Lord watch over each of you, bless all of you, uh, keep you safe in good health and well-being, and and help us all, Lord. We are all having difficult times. It's a struggle out there. May the Lord... May the Father, may the King, may the Son keep all of you safe in Yahushua Yahweh's name. Um, a number of things that uh, I, I've heard uh, from people in the Pentagon that the buzzword in, in, the, in the secret of secrets in the Pentagon is uh, the Sumerian gods are returning. And that's what they're referring to is that whole area uh, uh, that uh, Peter. Wow. Said. Can you repeat that again, just in case anybody missed it? The well, buzzword uh, in in the Pentagon, in the you know the military circles that are in the know about the cover up here, um, the they kind of in, in whispered tones talk about the return of the Sumerian gods, and they're talking about the uh, what we would call aliens or fallen angels returning uh, into the Middle East, uh, into old Sumer area. The Anunnaki. Well. 
could be. Do Under the other ancient names. Do yeah. you think that has anything to do with why we're in a Good night, all. God bless. That's indeed what's going on. The, the creatures figured out that there was one way that they could frighten mankind, and that is to present themselves as technologically superior beings from physical UFOs. Why would they want to abduct human beings? UFO abduction might not be caused by physical occupants, but from creatures living in perhaps what we would call another dimension. Mm-hmm. Posing as occupants. Yes, the same type of interfering, harassing, uh, paraphysical creature in every culture worldwide. Welcome, friends, readers, listeners, viewers from wherever you may be tuning in, whichever part of the world. I hope that life finds you well and in good health and happy and finding joy in your every day. And I also hope and pray that um, your family members, your children, your loved ones, those that you care the most about, that they are also finding urgency in the moment and waking themselves up to the reality of what's going on around us and uh, what we as a world, as a collective, are facing together with the onslaught of the New World Order and the push for global government, the the necessity of the transnational elitists, uh, their belief that they need to push a third global war. And that in doing so, they can propel their agenda to the next. Love Talk Radio. And in those days, there were giants in the land. And the sons of the angels of God looked upon the daughters of men and found them fair, and took of them wives. And their sons became of old great men of renown. So they have been mixing with us on a genetic level since the time of Enoch and Ezekiel's will. Here on Earth, we're intrigued by the sun, moon, and stars, and imagine there's got to be planets like ours. Some conceive of a face on the surface of Mars, so indeed of a meaning and purpose we lost. That indeed they believe that these might be our gods, or that maybe with time we'll do right and evolve, and eventually reach what they seek, and then solve all the problems of man, but they really don't know that they fall, and the works of our hands are but just filthy rags, so we travel the lands to dig up our past, time our lands to and with it are much of the facts I'm imagine that God came in alien craft They react in this way They're so desperate for meaning and purpose But satanic service They know that they have evil motives Am I making you nervous? Ha, I'm just scratching the surface The signs from Ezekiel's will When the skies unfold like scrolls And the breaking of seals Heed the warning The message is clear Heed the warning the time draws near, see the signs from Ezekiel's wheel When the skies unfold like scrolls in the breaking of seals He's a warning, the message is clear, he's a warning The time draws near, in the blink of an eye All believers will be raptured, anyone left receives a mark of their caption This leader will arise, claim his origins are alien Possessed by Satan on the side of the Nephilim Profess those who left Back from evolving, and now that they're gone, we'll solve all of our problems. The worship of any one God will be all but evolving to God, then I felt the exalted. I'll play on these lines, and in time I'll devise and arrive at a plan that will help hypnotize all the ones left behind. The spiritually blind, he's sold in their souls, now we see in their minds. It's already started, we're seeing the signs. Just study the word prophecies all the line that chop off the head. Of all those who fight at one earth, one world, aren't you excited? The signs from Ezekiel's wheel, when the skies unfold like scrolls in the breaking of seals, he's a warning. The message is clear, he's a warning. The time draws near, see the signs from Ezekiel's wheel, when the skies unfold like scrolls in the breaking of seals, he's a warning. The message is clear, he's a warning. The time draws near, where will you be? In the year 
2012 Are they casting a spell? They're not ready to tell It's time to reveal what they tried to keep veiled Your evil they hail and they sell it so well He fell from the heavenly realms where he dwelled A once beautiful angel that tried to rebel Expelled from the light into darkness and hell Now a serpent and snake with reptilian scale He wears a disguise with angelic wings And mimics the truth with a lie so obscene He always repeats the same thing he told Eve That you'll be supreme, a king or a queen That you can evolve to an enlightened being A god of your own that can do anything He feeds on our souls with this fraudulent scheme In so many ways, but it's all just the same We can hide from Ezekiel's will When the skies unfold like scrolls And the breaking of seals He's the warning, the message is clear He's the warning the time draws near, see the signs from Ezekiel's wheel When the skies unfold like scrolls and the breaking of seals He's a warning, the message is clear, he's a warning The time draws near Why hide yourself with, you know, creating UFO crafts and things like that? Why that deception? The beast system where it says they, they would mix themselves in with the seed of man. So that's an interesting uh, passage to look at as well. This will be the third part ongoing series of the trees in paradise uh, and the discussion between the, the enmity between the seed lines and the war between the seed lines and how it's culminating to where we find ourselves now with the with the trigger point being Israel and Iran. And that even though Iran hasn't attacked any of its neighbors in a very long time, and, and though it is being given support and aid to build this nuclear bomb so that it can be a threat for this, you know, the push for this next war. Iran's military is not uh, that formidable in sense that as as far as size-wise, but as far as guerrilla tactics and terror-wise, It's like a rabid dog. You know, these terror groups are like rabid dogs. They're like animals that are dangerous even unto themselves. And um, and it's, it's sad that necessary height to then culminate the whole end game of what they've been aspiring to all these decades and years and centuries, even millennia, that the New World Order is nothing new. It's the same thing that Nimrod had set up so long ago in the first attempt to unite the world uh, in his uh, push to create the Tower of Babel. Same thing. We know what the Lord thought about the New World Order then. Came down, confounded the tongue, separated the peoples into groups and tribes so that they could not understand each other in language and dialogue. Confusion reigned. And so that one world organization was disrupted and broken up and uh, scattered abroad. And so the the New World Order this time, they may succeed for uh, a short while for the time that those ten kings give their power unto the beast. And this system may reign for a short while, but we know that it too will be destroyed by the cornerstone, the and he who was rejected. And so that whole vision and the prophecy 
of Daniel in, in the statue um, is the same thing. We are culminating to the end point of